Yes. Nice to know. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Tim, um, and thank you all for coming or attending uh, my presentation online. Um, as Tim already said today, I'd like to talk about learning video, uh, or as I like to call it, dynamic multimedia and organic uh, chemistry. But before I start with that, I'd like to briefly outline why I think it is important to talk about that. Well, chemistry in general is a highly visual science. And this is due to the fact that chemists aren't able to observe atoms or particles at some microscopic level, which uh, makes them heavily reliant on uh, different forms of visualization in order to share information in their field of work. Um, and when doing so, what we chemists tend to do is to um, take all these structural informations we have about molecules and compress them into this weird looking skeletal formula, um, which actually is really hard for students because there's a lot of information which is implicit and cannot be readily seen. So, for example, we expect the students to know that there are hydrogen atoms, even though they are not shown. And um, this for novices might be feasible on a small scale, but if we think about it in a more complex mechanism, oftentimes there's just too much information for them to process. And there's evidence that students react to that with um, focusing on superficial features such as functional groups alone without understanding the actual underlying structural properties. And um, that's a problem because this oftentimes leads to false mechanistic uh, problem problems and makes them unable to uh, solve like authentic unknown problems. Um, however, if we wanted to um, incorporate dynamic multimedia or learning videos into organic chemistry teaching, there are possibilities to counteract these findings. And this is what I did uh, for the other reaction and what I want to talk about today, which brings me to my structure, in which I want to give you a brief overview about my presentation. So first of all, I'd like to explain all the design criteria that I followed for the design of the structure material. After that, I'm going to uh, explain the method with uh, which I came up to assess activity, uh, no, design and effectivity of the structural material. And after that, I'm going to present the results and try to draw some conclusions from that. Well, the starting point for all the design criteria or principles that I followed uh, would be the cognitive theory of multimedia learning by Richard Bayer. Unfortunately, I don't think that I have the time to give you an in-depth explanation. So um, for a basic understanding, we could assume the, the human working memory as the part where all the learning and information processing is carried out. Um, so the, the human working memory is actually divided into two channels, one being the speech channel and the other one being the picture channel. And each channel processes the respective form of information. So that eventually in the speech channel, a verbal model is formed due to information processing. And in the picture channel, a pictorial model is formed. And these two models are then used together with prior knowledge from the long-term memory to uh, construct a mental model, a more sophisticated, uh, superior mental model, which then can be used to solve problems. And this is how the cognitive theory of multimedia learning frames learning. This is how learning works, according to the theory. So what happens now if the students or if students wanted to learn organic chemistry with a textbook, textbook is that uh, the picture channel uh, would be heavily overloaded. And this is due to the fact that um, text next to all the uh, pictures in a mechanism is perceived as a picture as well, at least initially, until we make sense of it or fill it with sense, and then it's eventually transferred into the speech channel. So the first thing that we could think about to make and um, to facilitate learning organic chemistry is to distribute um, information equally to both channels. And this is uh, what uh, the, the theory of multimedia learning calls the multimedia principle. However, this isn't as easy for organic chemistry because not all information from a mechanism should be conveyed in the form of speech. If we just uh, think about um, the structural integrity of molecule, for example. So that I choose, oops, yeah, um, choose to leave all the structural information about molecules in the form of pictures and therefore um, convey like properties or reactivity of molecules in the form of speech. And what this does, according to the theory at least, is to put um, or to provide some relief for both channels because um, now the risk of overloading the channel is, is lowered, right? And this, in fact, should result in the construction of a more elaborate, sophisticated mental model which uh, should enhance uh, problem solving ability of the students. So, another thing we could think about is called the signaling principle. That means, um, or this principle states that uh, you should um, highlight information that should be seen together. Um, and funnily enough, 
or interestingly enough, this is something that organic chemistry does on its own to some extent. If we think about the mechanism and all these weird curved arrows, these are just visual cues for us to make um, or to make it easier to comprehend the movement from an electron to come direct respect to another. Um, so in addition to that, I choose um, encirclements in order to highlight certain parts uh, of molecules, uh, which I refer to in the videos. Uh, and I use the color coding to um, like mark or highlight certain prominent molecules for the other reaction. For example, it's really uh, important to um, have nucleophile and electrophile. You can do that with uh, green, uh, green, yeah, red, or blue, for example. And what this does, according to the theory, is this would um, facilitate the information intake because it's much clearer which information is important and has to be processed. And in addition to that, this also facilitates um, the construction of the dimensional model, which can then be used to solve problems and so on, because actually it's a lot clearer which information has to be used together in order to solve the problem. Uh, and the last uh, principle that I follow is uh, the segmented principle, which states that the learning content should be divided into smaller units, which can more or less stand on their own. And that's as well something that organic chemistry does on its own to some extent, because if we just took a look at the other reaction, we could readily divide it into four different reaction steps, which could stand on their own, more or less. So um, still, I choose to um, divide it into three reaction steps, because the third step is just the protonation of the oxygen uh, atom to form a more stable intermediate. That's nothing fancy going on there. So um, I ended up with dividing it into three different um, steps, being the deprotonation, the other addition, and the other condensation. And what this does, according to um, the theory, is um, it provides relief to like the whole, or it makes the whole learning process a bit easier because you allow the students to take breaks and they can process information so they're in their own pace. And this should result in a more uh, sophisticated mental model and thus enhance the ability to, to um, solve problems, for example. So one thing I forgot is that I um, added a little indicator at the bottom of the screen to show the students any time where they are and which segment they are. All right, um, so what were my research questions? So I explained all the design criteria that I thought that can be derived from the computer theory of multimedia learning, and I was wondering if these criteria or these principles were actually exclusive for multimedia or if they can be applied to a textbook as well. And for uh, the second question, um, I was wondering if we, if we were to compare students who learned uh, organic chemistry uh, with dynamic multimedia to students who learned uh, about the same content with a textbook, if there were any differences in their ability to transfer that knowledge onto like unknown problems. Um, so in order to um, investigate those research questions, uh, I conducted a control group design study at the University of Vienna, Germany. Sadly, uh, the sample size uh, was just 14, um, and I'm totally aware of the fact that this kind of limits my possibilities to draw conclusions from that. But um, sadly, due to all the COVID-19 restrictions that were in place at that time, there wasn't anything I could have done to uh, gather a larger um, sample size. So, I tried to fix it for further uh, studies. Um, so after some uh, initial information about the procedure, um, the students received their, their treatment, their, their respective treatment. And after each segment, they were asked to um, what extent uh, they thought the, the design principles that I mentioned earlier were applied to their material. And in order to, to measure that, I um, formulated uh, items for each design principle that I mentioned earlier. For example, for the signaling principle, I asked them if they thought the usage of color has contributed to their understanding. And uh, in addition to that, I asked them um, if they found they could easily understand the movements of electron pairs from one step to another. And they could agree on that on a four-point Likert scale, which I call I don't agree to, I totally agree. Um, so in order to assess the transfer ability, um, after the, the treatment, I asked them to solve four tasks to the other reaction, which I want to um, show to you on the next slide. Um, uh, I have to be really careful to not get too geeky about the organic chemistry thing, so um, I try to uh, do it fast forward. So the first 
response was actually a fairly easy one. Um, I think they only had to rank these five compounds in uh, according to their high, to their uh, symbols. So the second task was um, uh, a mechanism for the algorithm reaction, nothing fancy as well. Uh, they should suggest a mechanism and um, suggest uh, the, the, the final product. And uh, the third task um, was actually this, the same the same uh, task as task two, but it was the other way around. So uh, uh, the product was given and they should state the compounds which can be used to um, prepare this product. And um, the final task, uh, the two compounds were given and they were asked to um, suggest different mechanisms and different products, different, different products, and then um, give a reason statement about which product um, would be the preferred one uh, to be formed. Um, so now for the results. Um, since I pretty much came up myself, they've already uh, tested for a design and so on, um, I had to perform a item analysis at first um, to see if the items I came up with were any good. And the results can be seen in this uh, table. Uh, as I told you, for each principle, I designed two items. And the third column shows the discrimination index for each item, um, which ideally should be above 0 0.6, which uh, none of the um, discrimination indexes are, um, which is bad. Um, and this, this finding is supported by the, the value in the second column being the actual difficulty. Um, and one might ask, like, isn't it a good thing actually that nearly 80% 80 80 uh, fully agreed on your questions if the usage of color has contributed to their understanding? Uh, yes, maybe, but uh, from a testing point of perspective, this means that my test or the items that I came up with aren't really able to differentiate really well between uh, the individuals in my sample. And uh, finally, this is supported by Converse Alpha, which you can see in the third column. Um, should ideally be above 0 0.8. Um, so one had to draw the conclusion that the items that I came up with aren't really, don't really represent the, uh, the design principles. Um, uh, in, the, in the next two uh, columns, you can see the means and the standard deviations for convergence and experimental group. And what can be seen uh, immediately is that there are little to no differences. And I conducted a two sample t test in order to check if these small differences maybe could have been um, significant, but uh, sadly they are not. So I'm going to draw a conclusion on that later. Um, for the next thing, for the test of um, transferability, um, I, as a, the table shows you uh, the means and the standard deviations for control group and experimental group as well. Um, as well as the total score at the bottom of the table. And um, there are differences, and these differences are for task one and task two a little bit in favor or slightly in favor of the control group. And for task three and task four, the differences are a bit more clearly in favor of the experimental group. Um, and the total score is, uh, or the experimental group did perform better overall, which you can see in the total score. Um, although this might be due to the fact that task four just gave a bit more points than let's say task one or task two. So we have to be careful with that. So I wanted to know if uh, these differences were significant. So I conducted a second two time sample um, t-test, um, which you can see in the next two columns. And uh, the, the important one is the, the second column, um, which is, uh, shows the significance. And sadly, um, none of these uh, differences were significant except for task three, but it's it's really close. So um, we have to be really careful with that. Um, on th uh, although one thing I find really interesting is that the standard deviations uh, for the experimental groups are for every task a um, bit higher or actually a lot higher than for the control group. And I've thought about it for a really long time. And the only like plausible explanation I came up with is that um, the effectiveness of the multimedia treatment or the, the treatment for the experimental group is actually a lot more dependent on personal preferences or um, on certain traits of the, the individuals. But um, if you have any coherent explanation for that, I'd be happy if you join me in the discussion. <laughs> All right, um, coming to an end, um, I'd like to answer. <laughs>
And my research question, as a reminder, first I wanted to know if the design criteria I derived from the cognitive theory of multimedia learning were exclusive for dynamic multimedia, or if they can be applied to the textbook as well. And the second question was if there were any differences between the two groups um, in their ability to transfer their knowledge to unknown problems. Um, so since the, there were no um, differences between control group and experimental group, um, one could say that design criteria I derived can be applied to um, static monomedia textbook, textbook as well. Um, but that's not really a conclusion one could make um, because the, the results of the item analysis were really poor. So um, it's not something I want to conclude. Uh, secondly, um, since the there are since the differences were existent between control group and experimental group for the test of transferability, one could say, or draw the conclusion, that learning with dynamic multimedia um, resulted in higher transferability for a difficult task, because we saw that the, the means were higher for task three and task four, and I said that the task increased in difficulty. However, we have to be careful with that as well, due to the small sample size, and due to the fact that the differences weren't significant either, except for task three. <laughs> so, Bit of odd note, um, but I'd like to give you one last uh, implication for teaching that I can uh, safely make. Make so if you are a lecturer in organic chemistry and you have the possibility to try out dynamic multimedia, I encourage you to do so because it's hard, it's really funny and at least it seems like it's promising to, for teaching organic chemistry. Um, all right. That was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.